All right, good morning. My name is, oh, no, it's not being recorded yet. Got it. All right, good morning. I'm Sam Finney at Trophy Point Realty Group, and this morning we're doing some training on short-term vacation rentals. Um, so pretty much right away, we'll go over to the document here. Do, 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 do. How do I get back to this, Katie? I'm already messing it up. That's like, all right so we'll go into sharing the screen oh. <laughs> need to do the chrome huh okay all right so all right so basically um for short-term vacation rentals it's a lot easier to get it anywhere outside of city limits and inside of the city limits of Savannah. <laughs> so um, I put a lot in here about what they, you know, the different limits that they have within the city limits. Basically a short-term vacation rental is anything less than 30 days. So you can have something up um, and do 30 days or longer and pretty much all of these rules don't apply to you, but there's a whole bunch of verbiage on the city website about the different wards, the cap being 20%, they put in that cap a few years ago. Um, and generally speaking, it's, it's pretty much filled up inside of the city um, and all the wards. They have a couple of different maps to show you where the current vacation rentals are, um, but those aren't frequently updated and could be wrong. So. Basically the simplest and easiest way to go about it is to find somewhere outside of the city limits. Um, I included a map a little bit down below. So the, the rest of unincorporated Chatham County and then the map uh, word right there has a link that you can use to go check it out. Um, but I'm not gonna dwell on that a whole bunch. There's a variety of rules and regulations, um, but in general, it's a lot easier just to have one outside of the city than it is inside. All right, so I'll let y'all look that over, uh, read through it a little bit, and if you got any questions at the end, we can kind of circle back to it. Um, what is possible and very doable inside the city limits is what's called an executive rental. So it's basically a furnished place for rented out for 30 days or longer. Uh, the target there is pretty much traveling nurses, um, you can also do like movie producers or anybody that's, you know, on a work from home sort of situation um, and is looking to come stay in Savannah for an extended period of time. And those can also rent for, for generally much higher than a regular long term rental can be. Uh, with those, you probably you're going to want to obviously talk to the guests and see whether they want the place cleaned regularly, um, whether they don't want it cleaned at all. Um, and then kind of come to an agreement on what, what's expected of you and what's expected of them, right? Some people might want it cleaned every week. They might want fresh toiletry, you know, toilet paper, all that stuff restocked. Um, that's just a conversation you probably want to have up front rather than getting a phone call a weekend saying, I'm out of toilet paper. You need to give me some more. Um, so usually smaller units. So again, most of the time you're not catering necessarily to families here. Um, it's more to individuals who are coming in. So a two one or even a studio apartment would probably work best. Now, the only caveat for that would be um, I have seen, you know, executive rentals that they work a lot with insurance companies. So if somebody's house burns down, their family needs a place to stay. The insurance company would pay for that. Right. Um, so that's another option that would probably be better for larger places, um, but something, something to dig in further at a later date. Uh, moving down, so Tybee, uh, they recently put a cap on it when you got in just yeah. before the bell. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. So yeah, Tybee. Pretty much unless it already has a, a certificate, um, my understanding is it's gonna be pretty difficult to get it. Uh, Thunderbolt, so now we're, we're kind of venturing out into Chatham County. Thunderbolt recently changed their regulations a couple months ago. So now it's, a, before there were no regulations, now it's a $700 annual fee. 
um, for a license and you have to get a license now. There is not a cap to my knowledge, um, but again, these things, they seem to be changing pretty rapidly. So whatever, and there's a little note at the bottom, but if you're ever going under contract, just double check during due diligence. If it already has a certificate that it's transferable um, and make sure that that's the case. And then if it's one of these other areas that we're saying it's, it's probably good to go, double check that during due, due diligence because it could change pretty quick. Um, so for Chatham County, it's going to be over kind of where um, the Truman changes from going south to going west. Mm -hmm. um, so in that area, that's where the Chatham County, I can, I can text it out or add it to this document afterwards as well. Um, but if you're not in Thunderbolts, a lot of these other places that are listed, uh, Whitmarsh, Wilmington, Georgetown, Port Wentworth, a lot of those are just gonna fall under Chatham County. So that's gonna be $350. Uh, you need to make sure that you've got a fire station subscription, which is like 300 bucks, I think. Um, and then you have to show proof that you've already paid for trash. And I'll, I meant to include that as a link. I'll throw that in here after this, but I'll, I'll have a link for the application there as well. The other big thing, your insurance needs to say that you have a, a short-term rental or at least some sort of rental going on at that property. Um, and they have the exact verbiage on the website. So, and as you can see, so these different areas, right, you're gonna attract a different crowd for each of them. So probably on the islands, um, you're gonna have a lot of bachelor, bachelorette parties um, possibly, and then just families that are coming to visit. And a lot of this, all right. so if you got a bigger place, you're gonna be catering more towards family gatherings and large groups. Um, if you got a smaller place, it might be more couples coming out or something a little bit uh, toned down, so. For Port Wentworth, so up there, there's a lot of work going on at the dock, obviously, and SCAD's got a lot of work. So like we've had the same person who's working as a SCAD contractor stay at our place, I think four, four weeks, Monday through Thursday in the last two months. Um, and he just keeps, keeps coming back. So that's also an option. What's up, Wynn? Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. So, and then even, you know, at the port or a lot of people, um, you know, bring their ships here to get worked on and yachts or whatever else. So they might be stuck here for a month or two months and you could have more of an executive sort of thing going on there. Um, so there's a lot of options. I mean, Kate and I have had folks from folks visiting from France that came in and stayed. We had a professional golfer with his two golf buddies that were coming in for a tournament that stayed for a week long. So you get, you get a lot of different folks coming in. Um, and then finally, and this is kind of going back to inside the city of Savannah, uh, the best way to get around the cap is to either buy a multifamily and have an owner occupy permit the trouble with that is if you ever move out, then you've got to shift it over into executive rentals. Um, and technically you won't be able to do long-term rentals or excuse me, short-term rentals anymore um, or get something that's commercially zoned. Uh, and then the cap doesn't apply or shouldn't apply. So, <clears throat> so moving down. So some of the best practices um, and just a little bit of background. So there's, two different ways that you can kind of go about doing it. Um, you can just use Airbnb, which is the simplest and you can get a lot of traffic. So there's a lot of folks that don't, don't even go outside of Airbnb. So they automatically take out all the taxes for you, file those so you don't have to worry about it. Um, it's, it's a simpler process in that respect. If you start expanding to like VRBO and having it listed on multiple different sites, then you gotta start um, worrying about the calendar, making sure that you don't have double bookings and all of that. So usually 
Um, so Logify is one that Aaron Miller uses for his rentals um, that I use as well, but it kind of keeps your calendar straight and make sure that there aren't double bookings or anything like that. All right. And then the other thing kind of with that um, is there's a whole bunch of pricing softwares out there. So like, I don't know when, you know, some concerts going on in Savannah or when a big events going on. Um, so price labs, there's a whole bunch of different ones out there, but you pay like 20 bucks a month per listing and they automatically raise the price if there's not much available or lower the price a little bit if it doesn't look like it's going to be a busy weekend. Um, and then you can go in there and modify and adjust it as you see fit. So that... Mm-hmm. Your VBC is different than yep. your VO, different than all these others. Correct. Not to dwell on that too much, but do they like change the price for you or do they just send you an email with a suggestion? No, so they, they'll change the price for you and then you can go in there and adjust it. So like for ours, we were noticing we've got every single weekend out to, I think, July booked right now. So I went in there and I upped the Friday night and Saturday night rate by 25%. And then the weekdays, we don't, I mean, some of them are booked, some of them aren't. And so if there's a weekday that's coming up, you can either select certain days and lower the price X percentage. Um, or like I have Monday, I guess, Sunday through Thursday discounted like 15%. So you can play around with it a lot. You can have it to be where if it's, if there's a vacancy, and like the next week, then it slowly discounts the price as it gets closer and closer to try and make sure you're, you're keeping your doors open. But again, I mean, similar to long-term rentals, the lower the price goes, um, sometimes the less, the less good people take care of it, right? So if, you, if you're willing to lower your price way down, you might be making more money on the books, but that's not to account for them completely trashing the place or breaking things or whatever else, right? So there's kind of a there's kind of a balance there of what you're okay with going down to. Um, so another way that this is very different and y'all can see um, when we go down here, the management fees. So usually long-term management is 10%. Short-term management is between 20 and 25 of the gross revenue, right? And that's because some of these best practices, um, it's more of a hospitality business. So think of hotels more than anything. So if, you know, for example, if there's a rat in the property and you get a call at nine o'clock, then you're going to be calling an exterminator and getting him out there immediately, or you're going to be going to Walmart and getting some rat traps, which I've done before. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you need to be responsive. Um, you need to make sure that there's some clear expectations. So as far as like pictures and everything, right? So you want to, you want the place to look good, but you also don't want to have the place look so far above and beyond what's there that people show up and they go, what the hell is this? Like I booked a nice place and this is not nice. Right. Um, so I've seen that happen before. So if you're going to, if you're going to market it as a very high quality stay, um, you need to make sure that it actually is reflected and that the pictures don't just make it look awesome. And then they walk through the door and it's, it's less than awesome. Yep. So if a guest comes and destroys or breaks something in the house, mm -hmm. say you have it on, you have it through a website at Airbnb or a man, like, is that, is that, is there an insurance policy on that separate than your homeowner's insurance or who pays for the, I mean, the, how does that get adjudicated? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things. So you have a security deposit. Um, so we have our set at 200. So it's for basically anything a little bit smaller. If it was a bigger issue, like somebody punched a hole through a wall or completely destroyed the, the kitchen or something like that, um, then yeah, you would you would file it through Airbnb. You'd provide pictures and all kinds of stuff. And they it for you. Correct. Is that part of the kind of net? Why is it Yep. Yeah. So that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I mean, like anything dealing with insurance, it's going to be, it'll be an uphill battle. 
um, it's probably going to be a real pain in the butt. So the best, the best way to do it is just to try and prevent it altogether. Um, and you can set the, the settings to where they have to message you first uh, about why they're coming into town or whatever else. And then Airbnb, I'm not sure on VRBO, but you can set your house rules, right? So yeah, you can say, say no bachelor parties, like absolutely yep. not allowed. Yep. Like we'll have stated in some of those before. Yeah. So yeah, you can set your house rules however you want to. And then if they're violating those and there's a lot of there's a lot of different gadgets that you can get so like one of them is called noise aware um and so it basically averages out the sound volume over a period of a couple minutes and so if the if the noise threshold is above a certain level or averages above a certain level um for over a couple of minutes then you'll get an alert on your phone and you can go check it out right so it's not listening to what they're what they're saying necessarily sure, you're not, Sam. Sure. i'm not I don't care that much. I got I got other things to but do. But then you would know it's like a dog barking. Yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's a method. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah, I don't. I've never had any desire to put cameras in the house. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So like installing a ring or something. Um, either a ring or a camera light that just only looks at the driveway. So I think you can have a ring. Yeah. So you're alerted. Yeah, I've stayed at multiple that have a ring. So you have yeah. Bring that way, at least you have some knowledge of. I mean, it's so back to the coordinate back. entry that way, or like check in too. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. have different systems for for how to do that and the smart locks and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can buy a box you can like reset from your phone. Yeah. Like, yeah. So all I mean, there's anyways, getting back to like the the insurance thing, like yeah, you you go through the whole process, you file a claim. Um, just like anything, there are horror stories out there of them not doing anything to help out. Um, I don't know. We haven't we haven't gone through it, but I'd say the best the best thing would be just to avoid it altogether. There's risk, whether it's long term, yeah. short term. People could destroy a house if you own it and have people saying whether it's for a couple days or a couple years, like you are, it's not free money. I mean, mm -hmm. It's a calculated investment that you're taking to say, hey, I want to do this, but it's, yeah. They also yep. sign a lot of paperwork when they actually bring the property. You start your account and then you bring the property, you have to sign two different things, and the fee is very easy, but you yeah. sign a better All right, so going down a little bit. Um, so we already touched on photography a little bit. All right, as far as like designing the house, I got lucky, Kate loves designing places. Um, but like Pat Pat mentioned when we were going over this, it's definitely worth, worth it to have somebody who's a professional or has an eye for it, make it look good, right? Uh, because again, you don't wanna make it look better than it is, but you wanna make it as good good looking as possible. Um, and one of the big things Kate and I have been surprised by is people, there's been, I don't know, probably 10% of the people who have left us a review that have commented on the kitchen and how they booked it because of the kitchen or their favorite part was the kitchen, right? So um, some things, I mean, that's something that we didn't expect, um, but I think the kitchen and kind of the common spaces and a little bit more of an open floor plan, obviously, if you're having a get together, you don't want a, a house that's completely closed off. In every room, right? So, uh, one of our one of our buddies was going through a company, and they mandated like you want to use this, use this design style, and kind of everything the same. So mm -hmm. you couldn't go and do what you wanted to do if you wanted to do with their company. You needed to kind of use their designer and have a certain style. That they yeah, and it gets down even into you know like white sheets. People like white sheets a lot more than different color sheets right uh, just for i think the cleanliness aspect or the hotel looking like a hotel aspect but um some different resources for pricing uh so air dna 
you have to pay for that one. I uh, included a website. They actually do short-term vacation rental loans. Um, so they, if you type in whatever address you're looking at, hit the beds, the baths, and then the number of people that you could probably have there, then it'll spit out a price from AirDNA. So it's not good for all across the market, but if you're just looking at one or two properties, that, that would help out. And then Mash Visor is another one I've seen used. Um, it's more so used for like new markets. You can do overlays of the average housing price and, you know, in different suburbs of the neighborhood or whatever else. And then the occupancy rate. So that's kind of how you could use it to target a new, a new city. Um, moving down a little bit. So operating expenses, again, management fee is between 20 and 25% of the gross revenue. Um, so not to insult anybody's intelligence, but gross revenue. So that's the total dollar amount coming in, right? So they take 20 to 25% of that. Um, prior to a lot of the taxes, a lot of the cleaning, all the other stuff, okay? And with, with short-term rentals, because of all the taxes and the, the additional fees and upkeep and all that stuff, it's, it's a pretty substantial difference that it's the gross rather than 25% of the net. Um, sales and use tax, hotel tax. So you're going to be paying all that as well as, you know, income tax. Um, so 7% for sales and use hotel tax in Georgia is $5 a day. And then there's a couple other minor ones. So just for general calculations, I'd put it at, you know, eight to 9% for taxes. Yes. Yeah, so all of so the taxes only apply when somebody is staying in there and paying you. Um, cleaning, it depends. It depends a lot on where you're at, and also it's one of those things where um, it's not worth it to to skimp on it too much, right? So you want to get somebody good to clean your property because if they miss a clean and somebody shows up at four o'clock and the place is a mess. Um, then you got a whole nother deal and you very well might lose a booking. I mean, I've seen week long, like $3,000 bookings out the window because the place, you know, the yard wasn't mowed and the place wasn't clean. Yeah. So it, it, uh, it really, I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the house, the location. So out on Tybee, since it's a drive for most people, um, that's going to be considerably more. So you're probably for like a three, two, you know, 12, 1500 square feet, you're probably looking at 150, 200 bucks a clean. Um, and then kind of the rest of Chatham County, probably between 70 and a hundred bucks, um, for a clean. And then downtown, uh, again, it's, it's more like Tybee prices for the most part. Um, but that's, that's a relationship that you either, if you're doing it, you want to have a good relationship with whoever's cleaning it or, you know, whoever you have property management, hopefully they have one or two good cleaners. Um, so you only run yours through air, you don't have, you are your property manager. Correct. You just source out Airbnb and what was the other one? That VRBO. But the calendar one, you said you use, so you're not messing up. Oh, uh, so Logify. Logify is that yep. on here? Uh, that is not. I can I can throw that in as well. Yeah. Um, and there's a there's a lot of different sites like that. So like Guesty is another one that does it as well. Um, and basically, they just they're just trying to simplify the process. So you can have your listing out on a whole bunch of different websites, not get double bookings, and then it's supposed to provide an easier way to communicate with the guests, um, which it kind of does, kind of doesn't, because some of the some of the platforms mesh well together and others don't. So um, moving down, so does maintenance become more expensive? Yes and no, right? Um, you're seeing, you or at least your cleaner is seeing the property probably every week or a couple times a week. So a lot of the deferred maintenance, if there's a small leak somewhere or something like that, it's actually a lot better than long-term rentals because if you have long-term rent renters, you know, the, the roof can be shot 
and there could be water dripping through the ceiling in three places and they'll just put a bowl under it every time it rains right and then you come in at the end of the year and you're like dude you could have just told me right Sure not to like, I'm not for it. I was like, yeah. Thanks for letting me know. You know, biggest yeah. thing for any such a fine line there. For any homeowner, yeah. whether it's long term, short term, stand on maintenance. For maintenance, if it if there's a, a call, like you gotta get on it because if you let it go, let it go, it's just gonna get worse. I, I guess that's something I didn't think about though. You're gonna be in there all the time. So mm -hmm. you'll be able to fix a lot of problems before they before they come on. Yeah. There's a fine line. Like I've stayed in so many of these, and I actually prefer these over like condos or hotels. Like they're great for vacations. But it's like I've dealt with, hey, if there's a problem, call me. Oh, are you there? Okay, great. You've arrived. Do you have everything you need? And being like overbearing. Like I've had some where I'm like, there's like signs every don't touch this, don't do this, don't do that. And then there, so there definitely is a lot of I don't yeah. That no. Ever. Well, and to be honest, I mean, and that's like not to not to do too much profile in here, but that's probably somebody who has one property who's might be a little bit older. Um, so yeah, that's. I mean, that's on you, but it takes more time and effort to be that person. Yeah, but I never so. People, but because he was so obnoxious, I didn't give him. A, I didn't give him a bad review, but I didn't give him a great review because he wouldn't leave me alone. And I almost made me think that there was cameras in the house because I'm like, why are you messaging me so much? Yeah. So you don't use that bowl. <laughs> yeah, that's the wrong four-star. So, so uh, four-star review is not like you know the kiss of death. Like, is it going to be five stars or nothing? Or no, it's not the kiss of death, but if you get a one star review, you've got to get like 45 star reviews to offset it. Yeah. So, yeah, if you get a one or two star review, it's, it's bad news bears. Yeah. Do you do anything welcoming for your guests? Like, we've stayed at some of those yeah. where they have like, not like we've had somewhere it's like bottle of wine, but again, it's like you said, price point. Like, welcome yeah. to our home. Kind of. um, no, we, we don't. Um, I've read a little bit up on it and I mean, I, I think, I think what's a, a lot more important than, you know, having something out on the table or whatever else is just having an accurate representation of the place. Right. Because when people, when people come, they're not going to necessarily expect a box of chocolates. Um, like we did, Kate and I talked about for the dude who came back for like four or five weeks in a row, yeah. like just getting them getting them something, you know, a small present or something like that, or like for Valentine's day. And like, we decorated the place for Christmas. Okay. Um, but I don't, that's something if you want to go above and beyond, but I don't know that you would actually see a great return on it for, for the time. That I spent. I think it's more important. People, people get what they're expecting to get. And that's, you know, and I might have missed it, Sam, but where do you base your pricing? Obviously, it's not as easy as pulling rental comps or yeah. So, so that's another one where Price Labs comes in, comes in, and then they'll they'll recommend a price, um, and then you can always tweak that too, right? So you can, like when Kate and I first had it listed, we didn't have any reviews or anything like that. So we had ours, I think, substantially lower. Okay until we started getting some bookings and then reviews. And I honestly, I left it lower for too long because then we started booking out like a month and a half, two months out. And then I finally increased it. Um, but that's the other thing too. You can, you can play around with it at any point, right? So if it's not booked, you can change the price however you want. Do you know anything about Brian County and what Brian County's rules are with I have no idea. Nope. Where do you go to find that information? To the county websites. Um, Every county website has a municipal code. Like, okay. it's usually, what was it? There's like a website that has a municipal code. Um, but just go to the municipal code and control F and look for STVR or 
STR. Okay. Um, and then that should shed some light on it. Yeah, I've never even looked into Bryan County. I imagine like, the thing about Richmond Hill, like almost everything in Richmond Hill is an HOA, and almost every HOA in existence does not allow vacation rentals. And if they do, they won't as soon as you start doing it, because all you need is one obnoxious party, and that's it, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's a that's actually a key point that I didn't throw in here. But yeah, anywhere anywhere in Chatham County, right? If it does have an HOA, that's pretty much a no go. For either executive or SCDR. Um, I, I think bylaws. I think uh, every, every HOA probably because executive isn't too much different than a long term rental. Yeah, I mean, some HOAs don't even long term rentals. Yeah, some don't. I mean, yeah. So yeah. townhomes, condos are in their covenants is HOAs, community HOAs. Will vary place to place. And the thing you got to keep in mind is even if, even though they allow it now, they can change the rules on you. Like, and they probably will. You know, if they don't have a rule against vacation rentals, and you start doing it, that's a matter of time before they're they're gonna outlaw it because most of the people living there don't want that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would never operate a vacation rental in an HOA unless you know, unless I wouldn't mind if I had to go back to it being a long term rental. You know. Well, I mean, but that's really anywhere. I mean, anybody can change rules. That's true. I mean, any government can change yeah. rules. I mean, here, yeah. nobody was up in arms when we put a 20% cap on downtown because uh, people who live in the area don't want. Well, you look at the map, and the map yeah. looks like it has measles. Like, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. so I'm not sure. Get with get with Kate. Bed. She'll she'll be all about that. It is. You go to lakes like Lake yeah. Louie or whatever, and you will pull into a community, and it's all they're all the same damn thing. Like, yeah. like, so just kind of going back to the you know rules can change whenever. So not to say that they you know Savannah or Chatham County or even Tybee couldn't one day come together and say all right, no more vacation rentals because um, they potentially could. Historically though. The most that they'll do or that I know of is they'll put a cap on it. So they're not going to screw over whoever has vacation rentals right now, but they're going to put a cap on it saying we're not doing any more of these. You got what you got. If you don't renew your license, then you're going to lose it. Um, and that's what we've seen historically. So. All the tax revenue it has coming in the hotel tax, the uh, mm -hmm. tax, the general just tax base with hundreds of thousands of people coming every year to staff with the tidy. I mean, they're going to want that. I mean, so, I mean, five or six years ago, this wasn't even possible because it just, yeah. there wasn't even Airbnb, there wasn't yeah. enough internet presence for any of this to make any sense. So, it's a new yeah. world that governments are lagging behind. Mm -hmm. Go catch up. I think yeah. COVID helped too. Because um, definitely was an increase with the Airbnb because nobody wanted to be in a closed, confined space. They didn't want to go to a resort. They didn't want to go to a hotel or a condominium. Like they wanted their own space to feel safe. Yep. And 
that's like I did some reading on that, and that's when they saw like a huge increase. Mm -hmm. It's just getting higher. And higher. Yeah. Well, and y'all, y'all are going to see here in a minute. Um, so we'll, we'll finish up the operating expenses part and then kind of open it up for any further questions at the end, but going back to the maintenance where we, where we got started on the tangent. So it's, uh, it is more difficult to plan maintenance, right? Because if you're looking at doing any sort of serious maintenance, it takes longer than a couple of days, right? The average, the average nightly stay for Kate Nye's place is 300 bucks. So if you take it off the market for a week, you're looking at losing two grand, right? So in that way, you kind of got to be a little bit strategic about it. And sometimes it's a lot easier to push off maintenance because you can say, well, that, that can wait for another little bit, right? Um, how much does it cost to furnish? Usually between 10 and 20K. Um, and I've got a sheet somewhere that I can, I can share with y'all as well about kind of what Kate and I put in ours and, and there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet. Sheet. My sheet? Sure. Um, but yeah, usually about 10 to 15 for a mid to smaller sized house and then 15, 15 to 20 for, you know, 12, 1300 square feet up to 2000 square feet. And that sheets, like everything? That's pretty much everything to start off with. Yep. Um, and obviously, that also depends if you're going to like Ashley's and buying all new stuff, it's going to be way higher than that. If you're going to Wayfarer, buying stuff like that, another good practice is to have outdoor rugs um, around every single bed. So outdoor rugs because they don't stain as easy. Um, and they just kind of help keep, keep the floor for a little bit longer and all that. When it comes to high use furniture or whatever, do you recommend going and spending a little bit more on furniture that you know will be easy to clean stains off of, but it costs more like sofa. I'm thinking of like sofa, like you could buy a really cheap one off Wayfair and it might be comfy, you know, it'll work, but like if the stain goes on it, that stain's stain, no matter how hard you try to clean it out. Is it yeah. Spend the extra money on that, or does it not matter? I think it, it, it just depends on, I mean, the cost. Or the yeah, cost. it depends on a lot of factors and also, you know, kind of where you're marketing it at. I mean, I think it's just, it's important to understand that the furniture is going to wear out quicker, right? People aren't going to take the best care of it. It'll wear out whether you get something that's very, very durable and easy to clean or whether you get something that's not it's going to wear out quicker than it should, right? Furniture, oh, go ahead. Furniture is KD in, in essence, but if you're looking at it as every two years, I'm going to have to replace my sofa, then you would want to lower your price point. Um, but yeah, it is that you get what you pay for, for sure. Yeah. So I don't really, I don't have a great answer for you there. It just kind of, it depends on what you're going for. I want to do white. Yeah. White. Um, Are you still like, you know, also put covers on everything. Mm -hmm. That's a big um, short-term thing on Tyvee is they just buy covers and they move it. Mm -hmm. 25 bucks and you get 20 of them and just throw it on cash every time. Yeah, it's like cover. Yeah. So asking for a friend. So, like, would you do more, like, uh, cloth or le I mean, leather would be a lot more durable, but then if you, like, or do you just do the, cheaper well it depends kind of, where you are like what sam like, goes back it, to suppose you're on the north side of time for a friend. no then you for would not friend. put leather in that house okay you're going to open up coastal look in that house you do like darker you can get away with blues and stuff like that but no you want to put leather leather's like lake cabin things like that or just a standard house okay. the front's a good guy by the way yeah i'm sure he is <laughs> Um, so yeah, I get, so another thing with like protecting your stuff. So you want to do mattress protectors, like waterproof mattress protectors, waterproof pillow protectors, all that jazz. That was going to be my question. Like mm -hmm. bed, bugs. if you ever dealt with that before. No, thank the Lord. <laughs> no, but. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's no, 
there's no like treatment that you can have like termite or whatever. But Not like a yearly it. thing, but like when yeah. it happens, when it comes. Oh to yeah, and it costs a shit ton of money. No, I know yeah. that. It's, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, pest control is definitely something that's worth investing in, obviously, because um, again, any you know a day or two that it's taken off the market is five hundred bucks. So paying a couple hundred for pest control is is well worth it. Um, and then going down to how much can we make in this market? Um, the short answer is it really. It really depends. There's a lot more factors than long-term rentals. You got a long-term rental that's a three-two. It's in downtown. You know it's gonna make. You know you know somebody's gonna rent it for eighteen hundred bucks or something, right? Short-term rentals. It goes into you know what amenities do you have there? Is there a pool? Is there a hot tub? How does the yard look? Is it private? How does the neighborhood look? Um, what are your ratings? How many different platforms are you on? Um, all all kinds of stuff there. So as a general rule, um, somewhere between 20 and 60% NOI is what I've seen. Uh, so substantially higher than any sort of long terms. Um, and I mean, I can, I can talk with y'all a little bit later on about Kate and I's and how that's going, but it's, you can, you can make a lot of money in it. The issue is it's a lot more effort to manage and upkeep than normal right your return sam what do you what's your percentage you guys set aside of the oh shit account do you guys do that do you have an oh shit account like um we have a personal one <laughs> but yeah i mean because you think about it even if you have let's say you have a terrible terrible guest that trashes the place right i mean even worst case scenario let's say they completely destroy the countertops in the kitchen and like, you know, bust the marble and they break, you know, they break or whatever else, a couch and all that. Um, that's still going to be cheaper to fix than it would be to put in a new HVAC or a new roof or something like that. Right. So even, even in like the very, very bad case scenarios where they put somebody through a wall, you're still only looking at, you know, a couple thousand dollars probably. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. It could be. So, for being a landlord, for, long, said for long term rental, the data says, and everybody's freaking different, but the data has about $1,500 per door per year yep. is what you have set aside for a, a slush fund. Right? Whether, yep. it, whether it's a nickel and dime every month at 75 bucks or whether you don't get anything for three years and all of a sudden then you get the mage back. But $1,500 per door per year. Or yeah. For a short term, you're at least doubling that, just to be on the safe side with wear and tear and everything. So maybe yeah. three grand per door per year as a safe buffer, maybe. Yeah. Well, and I would even go above that. So I've seen, I've seen like 10, 10 grand or so for set aside for maintenance for you know three hundred thousand dollar property, and yeah. So, and that's not. Because you have furniture and decorations. And, yeah. I mean, you probably retain it more often because, yeah. So, you get away with stuff in the wall for two years, but not. Yeah. yeah so, you're talking about repainting, um, like doing all new linen every year or so. And the linen, usually you want like two and a half to three sets of everything, right? So, you're buying, if you have four queen beds in a house, we'll say you've got 12 full sheets, um, full queen sheets for it, right? And you're going to have to replace those every year. Costco, $20. Yeah. I'm telling you, best quality sheet I've ever seen in my life. So, really? Yeah. Um, oh, there you go. Sands, Costco. 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 And they have all <laughs> kinds of patterns. I know you want white, but yeah. I, they might have white, but it's literally, I think, 20, 25 bucks, maybe 25 for a king and 20 for a queen. And they are amazing. And they feel good. There you go. Um, but yeah, so just for, I mean, I guess the slush fund, I would, I would set aside, you know, probably ten thousand dollars for if you're looking at like a three hundred thousand dollar place. Again, for painting, for sheets, for, and the other thing too, like I was talking about, it's everything is much more time sensitive, right? So if you got a guest coming in, and you know the guest 
tells me tonight, hey, this isn't working or this is broken. And there's another guest who's coming in tomorrow who's paying $2,000 for the next week. Then I'm going to be calling whoever it is and telling them, hey, if you can get out there within the next five hours, you know, I'll pay you double whatever yeah, it is. Um, so, service calls, yep. instead of 100 bucks, it might be 250, 300 dollars for the same thing we get during the week. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that's the other reason the price is, is a little bit farther up. Um, larger scale, I've seen what they pitch is to the owners, they say per sleep in the house, is they'll have like a three bed, two bath, but technically you can sleep 20 people in there and they have a sunroom with one bunk beds in it. So, what they'll do is per head count, Per person that you put in there, they want five percent of each. Um, per, yeah, per person, five percent per person of however many people you have in there. But that also covers a lot of other things, like if you can't rent the place out for two weeks, something happens. In twenty twenty, we had a month where we couldn't rent out anything because that's the mandate; we couldn't do it because of COVID. So uh, that fund covered that. It covers repairs. It covers you can't rent it out for two weeks covers when your kid jumps off the bunk bed and breaks his arm that you're getting sued because there's no corporate mail there. You have to own the property like an owner. So it's your name. So a kid jumps off the bunk bed and breaks his arm and then the parents sue you because they're idiots. That's on you. And so that is also part of that fund, but that's on a large scale operation where that's all under the same name. It's all under the company. Yeah. Okay, which raises another question for liability. That's an interesting liability talk, but I would think you know, whether it's long term, short term, a lot of times you may want to take it out of your personal name mm -hmm. just for liability. So, in case somebody does get sued, they can go after the company assets, not your own personal assets. Yep. So, whatever the case is, you want to have it in an LLC, have, probably have some kind of an umbrella policy, mm -hmm. cover broken arms, lawsuits. Yeah. Well, and then that gets into that gets into the whole lending thing. So if you do have an LLC, then you're looking at a couple percentage points higher for interest um, and all of that as well. So it's yeah, something to think about uh, as well. The other big thing: no lenders like lending for short-term vacation rentals. Um, the one way I've found is to do what's called a DSCR loan. Uh, which is where they have the appraiser come out and appraise the amount that it would be able to rent for a long term. As long as your appraised long term rent is higher than your mortgage payment, your PITI, then they'll give you the loan. Um, so that's the best. There's also some places that do bank statement loans as well. Um, but usually, unless you have a proven track record, you're going to have to get creative with, with how you're going to get a loan for it because banks don't like it unless you can provide two years of taxes. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, kind of to wrap it up. So like we talked about, the game is changing constantly. So just because that's the way it was last week or today doesn't mean that it's going to be the same tomorrow. Um, and then just because a place has a permit doesn't mean it's going to be able to be transferable, right? So something to keep in mind. Um, and then I guess, does anybody have any other questions, comments, concerns? Cool. All right. I want, I want them so bad. Yeah, a lot more. It seems easy. It seems sexy. Just like HGTV moving the house seems sexy. Short term vacation around seems sexy. It's not. And then you get in there and realize somebody tiled your shower the wrong way. But I'm not organized or timely enough to, uh, to deal with that. So, yeah. yep. Um, so, and something to keep in mind with any, any investment, whether it's long term, short term, um, you, know, you don't need to be money back and gee to have these, but you do need to have. Availability of capital to take care of issues. This is exactly where I want to go eventually for me, just yeah. personally. A lot, of, yeah, a lot of people have a house or two and are undercapitalized and they don't have, um, you know, the, the ability to. to I mean, there was people selling, you know, April 2020, like literally one month and not make the money, and then they had to sell their asset that's now worth 
thirty percent more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only did they not have that one month, they could have yeah. covered mortgage payment for one month. Two thirds of Americans don't have. I mean, the statute two thirds of Americans don't have. You know, thousand dollars in the bank account for emergency fund. Um, you don't need to have millions of dollars to be a landlord, but you do need to have. You know, short term, you need to have ten, fifteen thousand yeah. dollars in an emergency fund. You need to have for long term rentals. You need to have fifteen hundred dollars per door for your emergency fund. A lot of people don't. We need to take care of your tenants. Did yep. you need to know if it's going to be a short term vacation rental versus just a normal rental? Yeah. For a long term. All right. So, so, so we'll, yeah. Well, you want? I'm just saying yeah. that, like, so who's to say I can't change they don't, my okay. business plan? So they, um, you know, if you're buying a place, if you have the income to qualify for one regardless, then they don't even know anything. You know what I mean? Okay. You know, you could just, just buy an investment property. You could just yeah. buy a house just to buy it unless it's vacant, as long as your personal income you know, meets, meets their requirements. Then it's no big deal. But if you need that income, um, they're they're not they're only going to underwrite off of. Um, and then it's what? Got twenty five percent down. It's still twenty five. You still get for twenty, but a lot of them are going twenty five now. Um, but they're typically looking at long term rents, and, and a lot of times they might want to see a lease in place already, depending on what you're buying. Or like if you buy a place to fix it up on a hard money loan and then refinance it, they're not going to want to refinance it until they see a long term lease in place. Okay. Like now, you can put a long term lease in place for a year, get your refinance, and then go that route. And do something now. But you also have to change the insurance policy. So we have to get a vacation on a rider. Um, okay. You know, so there's things that you have to do. Okay. But once you have, once you have the money, once it's close to home, I mean, you do whatever you want. You know. Okay. Yeah. Something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of these hard money lenders are switching to DSC, DSCR loan, um, bank saving loans. Um, yeah. There's no loans that specialize in vacation rental loans. You're probably going to pay a higher interest rate. So, over the last six months, over the last six months, a lot of our hard lenders that we're working with are putting out products for converting those hard money loans into long term 30 year notes, mm -hmm. which never used to happen, right? In order to get a 30 year note, you have to go to a bank, lending institution, have two years of bank statements and all that stuff. Now the hard money guys are all starting to offer these 30 year notes in house versus going on the open market. you said still a higher rate. Well, exactly. yes and no. So about three months ago, when I was quoting these out, they were six and a half, seven percent. I just got a quote yesterday for converting a hard money loan to a 30 year investment note at 5%. You know who they're selling those notes to? They're keeping them in house because here's what's happening. The inventory is so low. All these hard money groups are investor based. They raised funds, hundreds of thousands of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars of funds are raised. And if the supply of houses is low and people can't be flipping houses, all these hard money guys have money sitting in account. They're all cash heavy. So since the supply is low, they have too many funds in their bank. They got to get that money, making money for these investors, or else they're not going to make their return. So they're starting to put out all these products. All these hard money guys are putting out these products, and as they're more desperate to make returns, their interest rate is coming down. So now I got to go for five percent. I mean, if I go to an open market on an investment loan, you're probably going to get four and a half, five percent going through Bank of America or or whatever. But mm -hmm. keeping it in a house. They probably have already already have your financial information. They just do a switch of a loan and you do an appraisal and you're good to go. So that's going to be a whole nother avenue of lending for investors, um, which is going to be tremendous, all because it's a, it's a side effect of the housing trade. Yeah. So I guess kind of the last note before we, we wrap up all this uh, officially, but the other thing to think about, right, because I thought about this a little bit, having a short-term rental is what, what's your competition? I mean, your competition is basically hotels, right? Up until this point, they've put a cap here. They put a cap on Tybee. Um, they're, I'm convinced that they're going to put a cap pretty much everywhere um, because of how much money these things can make and the fact that 
people are just going to continue to do it and you're going to get some disgruntled folks in in the neighborhoods right so you're going to put a cap at some point i think um but ultimately it's less so about competing against other airbnbs i mean if you just look at the numbers you can have you can rent a place, you know, a hotel room in downtown Savannah for a couple hundred bucks a night, right? You're still going to be paying all the taxes and fees and all that. Um, or you could rent a place that sleeps five times as many people for less than double the price yeah. with a full kitchen, with some privacy, with a yard. Um, so I see the limiting factor, I think, isn't going to be, there's going to get to be too much competition. I think it's going to be trying to get in before they put a cap on it and before you can't do it anymore. So um, Sam mentioned um, DSCR. Does everybody know what a DSCR loan is? No. Uh, DSCR loan is debt service coverage ratio. ratio loan. So that means they don't care about your income as long as you can cover the debt at a certain ratio. So for your land, they, they took a rental income and if your debt service, your rental, your mortgage, all your debts meets a certain ratio and it covers that ratio when you do a loan, not necessarily based on your income or W 2 or any of that stuff. Thanks, that they usually look for like 35, 45%. So, like if you're bringing in, um, you know, a thousand bucks a month in rent, then you know, your mortgage must be around like $400. You know, I think that's. It's usually what I look for about getting a loan anyway. I mean, you don't want to need much more than that. Yeah. So um, on your debt service percentage to, you know, revenue. So I've talked to a few of them, Pat, and they're. If they're going on vacation, yeah. I think it's probably much less than that. I'm talking about well, long term rental income. No, so there, there's more than a few places out there that as long as it's above one, they'll give you the loan. So if you're. Oh, yeah, yeah. One, yeah. 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 But like 1. 3, 5, that's, yeah, that's that is cool. not. That's not a smart deal. So if you're, if it looks like it's gonna rent, your deck can be a thousand bucks a month as long as you bring in a thousand and one. Yeah. So, so like, you don't want to take that money. no, That's, no. So if you're doing a long term rent and your DSCR, you know, if it, if they say or you can rent it for fifteen hundred, and the amount that you can charge, or excuse me, if you can rent it for fifteen hundred a month and your mortgage payment is fourteen fifty, they'll give you a DSCR loan. But that is not something that you want to do yeah. because you're going to have all kinds of vacancy and maintenance and capital expenditures. Um, so you're going to be losing money on it. But for the sake of short term rentals, it can work out. But yeah, Katie, I think that concludes it. Unless anybody's got anything else. Yep.